You're listening to Fight Society with Damon Martin and Jeremy Loper. Check it out. Oh, what's up, kids? This is going to be a really interesting podcast, man. Breaking, 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 breaking news. It kind of worked out. We were supposed to do the show yesterday. Yeah. And somebody was in our podcast studio. <laughs> so we had to delay a day. How about we share a podcasting studio? Uh, we, we broadcast live from the... WRKZ FM production studio in Columbus, Ohio. It's the the hard rock radio station where I do uh, my morning radio show, Loper and Randy in the morning. It's basically right next door to where I do my normal radio show, but we share with these guys that do a weekly plant radio show. It's called Plant Talk, <laughs> which is I have no fucking idea how this show is huge, but it's on in so many markets, and we're a podcast. I don't get it. Plant talk. Yeah. How are we? First of all, I feel like I could host plant talk. <laughs> plant talk. It's going to be a medicinal episode, but we're going to host plant talk. All right. <laughs> That's just such a random. I, I mean, more power to him. Somebody's listening. That's all that matters. Actually, Zufa just brought uh, bought that show and hired Uriah Faber and Snoop Dogg to host it. Sorry. <laughs> plant talk plant, is gone now. Plant talk is now yeah. Snoop Dogg's new podcast. Let's get it out there. Damon Martin. I'm Jeremy Loper. You can follow us on Twitter, at Jeremy Loper, at Damon Martin. Same for Instagram. Hit us up, follow us, and get the latest on Fight Society. But let's just break out of the gate. John Jones, once again, is popped for a hot piss test from USADA. So a steroid violation, possibly. And last night, it was kind of sketchy. TMZ was reporting that he was stripped of the title. I mean, I thought that was kind of bold of them to make those accusations, but ha- well, what have you heard at this point? Well, basically, what we know for sure is July 28th was the test, the day before the fight. It was taken after the weigh-ins. Yeah. And okay, so after the weigh-ins. So after this the is weigh-ins. before the fight even starts. Before the fight even starts. Test, test is taken. It comes back now that it was positive for Terinabol, which is an anabolic steroid. Uh, Terinabol is a steroid that was actually discontinued numerous years ago. Uh, it was Terinabol was the steroid that was involved in that East German Olympic scandal back in like the 70s and 80s, right, or whatever it right. was, like when they were still doing a thing. So uh, Terinabol's been, been discontinued. It's like lewds. They've been discontinued, but it's still on the black market. So like people find it in tainted supplements all the time. Like it's just a dirty steroid. And so like people find it. So it's possible that it could be from a from a supplement, something like that. But long story short is it's, he tested positive for Terinabol steroids. He's been provisionally suspended. The title hasn't been stripped yet because they have to let part of this process play out with USADA. Uh, I talked. I got a statement last night from Daniel Cormier. Obviously, he's just kind of like a wave of emotions because you know he had kind of just started to settle in with a loss to John Jones, and now he's being told that he you know the fight's. I mean, chances are the fight's going to be overturned. Um, in these situations, so uh, there's, there's no doubt that this happened. I mean, like, I just, you know, I want to clear up any speculation. Like, does he have any sort of hope at all? I know like, you know, Jackson's released a statement hoping that this was going to be some sort of tainted supplement. Well, well, so so here's the deal. Uh, When USADA, USADA doesn't release this kind of information without being pretty sure about the testing, obviously. Um, and they'll, they'll request them to be sample tested, but it's the same sample. They just split it into two parts, so it's going to come back positive. I've never seen a B sample come back not positive from USADA. Uh, so it's going to come back. So, so at that point, it's up to John Jones and his team to try to figure out where the steroids came from if he's you know claiming he didn't actually use them, knowingly use them. Uh, they're going to say it came from a supplement. Now, that's not unheard of because there are a lot of tainted supplements with Terinabol. That's not uncommon. The problem is that John Jones is going to have is he's already used this excuse once before. When he got suspended last year for UFC 200, he tested positive for two different drugs that are typically used in a post-steroid cycle. Right. They proved that it was from that erectile dysfunction drug that he bought like off the internet, and it was from, I want to say, Mexico. Uh, and it was well, like they're a, like these yeah. these dick pills. They're yeah, like it was a black market, like it was, Rhino 9000. It was like a black market, black market erectile dysfunction drug, yeah, yeah. and that was tainted. Now- Again, I'm not saying he's a cheater. So he he did that. They proved that it was from those pills. Uh, he got a year of suspension. And let they, me tell you something. It's it's not out of the realm of possibility that normal – like, I've taken one of those before. And, you know, I've heard other people talk about them. And uh, we're sponsored on my radio show by this place called The Lion's Den, right? So they have that stuff. Yeah. And they were like, hey, do you want to try one of these? And I tried it. And, I mean, like, you could sword fight. You could definitely sword fight with your wiener. So I, I see the upside, especially if he's like, you know, doing cocaine and stuff like that, that has adverse effects on your wiener. 
I could definitely see him going for one of those. And that, to me, is not a big deal. It sucks that, you know, that he didn't do the research to make sure there was nothing in it the first time. But this, when you start, you started to name, like, specific steroids, and, and this started to come out last night. I was following your feed, of course, Damon. And I'm looking at this going, we didn't hear all this the last time. We just heard tainted supplement, and then the erectile dysfunctional stuff came out later. Yeah. But you are naming Trinable. I mean, like, we didn't well, say this the last time. And so here's the thing about that. And, and this is what I said. You know, this is what I've been saying, you know, in my head since this happened. I talk, talked to a couple of people last night. When you're John Jones. Yeah. And you're already under a microscope. From a year suspension. Yep. That just came up in July. I mean, literally weeks ago. You better be scientifically testing all of your supplements to make sure there's nothing in them. Like, yes, it's going to be expensive, and yes, it's going to be a pain. All in the of ass. them, Damon. We like to party. Yeah, you better test everything. So the tainted supplement excuse will not fly this time. I guarantee it. No, I the world's it. over it, man. Like, yeah. that, I was sitting at Jersey Mike Subs with my wife when I saw you tweeting about it for the first time, and I and I couldn't believe. I mean, you were you were so on top of the situation; it was ridiculous. And I'm sitting there going, I literally said in front of everybody, I go, are you fucking kidding me? And the woman goes, you wanted a club. Mike's way. And I go, no, 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 I'll take the sandwich, but John Jones, are you with me on this lady? Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, I just, it's one of those things where you just shake your head and you say it's unbelievable because John Jones, you know, when you look at John Jones from that fight, he did everything right after the fight. He won the fight. He finished the rivalry with Daniel Cormier with a knockout. There's no better way to close a rivalry than to do it that way. There was no controversy. There was no decision. He knocked him out. That's He closed the door on that rivalry. And then afterwards, John Jones said everything right. He, he, he paid tribute to Daniel Cormier, so we should all – you know, hold him in high esteem. His whole career doesn't come down to this one fight. Right. Um, you know, he's a good role model, and I hope we can put this rivalry behind us. Like, all the things you want a guy to say in that moment, he did. Like, in that moment, I was like, this is the John Jones we've all been waiting for. This is the John Jones that's grown up. He's learned his lessons. He almost had everything taken away from him. Yes, he did. And now he's back. And then to have this situation come up, you have to shake your head and just say that's, I mean, li listen, here's the reality of the situation, what he's looking at. This is a second-time offender. Now, even if they prove it was a tainted supplement, which, again, very well could happen. Ball is a, is a dirty drug that is out there in the supplement market, and I say this all the time. The supplement industry is not regulated. It is a dirty, dirty business. So you better know who you're getting in bed with when it comes to your supplements before you take them in the first place. That being said, a second offense is... Chances are John Jones is looking at a minimum of a two-year suspension because he already a had a minimum. One, minimum. And what's the maximum? The maximum he could be looking at four years off. That's so crazy. Yeah. That's out of prime. He's thirty. Yeah. Now they could. They. they the, 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 when I say minimum, the minimum they could. I mean, this is USADA. They could technically, you know, reduce him down to a year. Or even that's their problem. You know, that's their. Uh, that's their prerogative to reduce the sentence. So technically. He could get a year again. You know, they could say you're you're gone for another year with the tainted supplement. I just have a hard time believing that's going to happen. A second offense, a year, literally a year later, they're going to hit him with a, they're going to hit him with a minimum of a two year penalty. In my opinion, I think based on the drug Terenabol and based on his past history of them basically. I mean, if you read the if you read the transcription from the arbitration last year. When they gave him a year, you know, they basically blamed him. They said, you need to be more responsible for what you're putting in your body. Hell and that's yeah, why we're man. giving you a year. That's why guys like Yoel Romero and some other guys got six months and John Jones got a year because they're basically saying you, you knowingly took this erectile dysfunction drug black market off the internet and didn't do any kind of research as far as what was in it. So we're going to give you a year penalty. It's like a, as like a, a punishment. So at this point, I have a hard time believing they're not going to give him a minimum of two years. And I think in this situation, because it was steroids one year after his last suspension, Suspension, we could be looking at four years. And that Dana White said it last night, that could be the end of his career. That it is, really yeah. could. I, I mean, I, I don't I don't like the way he looked in the Ophens St. Proof fight, this last Daniel Cormier fight necessarily in the beginning. I think that you saw a John Jones that had not been in the octagon. You saw him trying to work off that quote unquote ring rust. You saw it. Everybody saw it. Okay. He's just that damn good that he can pull off victories and have these huge layoffs. But Eventually, that starts to, you know, you just you just don't get the results that you did when you were younger. Eventually, all of that wears off, and eventually you become human. And I think what we're seeing right now is John Jones is going to be grasping for straws. I mean, like, this is going to be the real downfall of a great champion. Somebody tweeted me earlier, which I thought this was, it's funny, but at the same time, it's kind of sad. 
they were talking about how, you know, this uh, thing with John Jones, it's terrible that we're never going to see him live up to his true fight potential. But goddamn, how good is that 30 for 30 going to be? Yeah, I mean, that's... <laughs> I mean, that's like, you know, obviously not, it's not the best time for jokes, but I mean, you know, that, but it is true. He's going to be another one of these guys that has a tremendous, crazy story that's off the field or out of the ring. Well, that's, that's the sad part about this is that, and I've said this, you know, I've said this numerous times, John Jones, in my opinion, is the greatest talent the sport has ever known. But when you have two situations, you know, when, when I was actually arguing with fans on Twitter before the, right after his win over Daniel Cormier, when I said he's the greatest of all time. Yeah. And I said, one of the things that does hamper his, because people are arguing with me, him versus Anderson Silva. Yeah. And I said, one of the reasons why John has a leg up, in my opinion, is, is Anderson got busted for steroids. You know, Anderson got busted after a fight. You know what I mean? Like, John Jones got busted before a fight, but it was proven to be what we, you know, the erectile dysfunction drug. Okay. I'm not saying he gets a pass. I'm just saying that, you know, they, and I trust you saw to prove what it is he took and what it is he didn't take. Um, in that situation. Okay. I'm moving past it. And I said, Anderson Silva tested positive for steroids for a fight with Nick Diaz. That's, that's a mark on his record. If you look, if you're comparing two guys together and they're both pretty awesome, what, what degrades one guy and what builds a guy, you know, what builds one guy up and, and the drug testing thing is, is a big deal. Now, with this question around John Jones, I mean everything that everything in his legacy becomes questioned. You know what yep. I mean? Like, did he cheat his entire career and he just didn't get caught? You saw it didn't that's come around until a couple years ago. That's you the know? first thing I thought, man. You know what I mean? And that's the downside of this is that well, no, it's not even a downside. It's because you do it it's to the yourself. real side. Yeah, it's you the do real it to side. yourself. And that's like I said, I'm not here to convict John Jones because at the end of the day, we got to wait for the whole story to come out. We got to find out. Do you but, think that there could be though, Damon? And and I don't want to be repetitive, but like, do you think there could be? An excuse for what happened? No, I mean, listen, Terenabal is a steroid. I mean, that's it. He didn't test positive. Like, when he tested positive for the drugs that are typically used after a cycle of steroids, you 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 get the hint of something bad happening. This time, he tested positive for steroids, Terenabal. Even if it's a tainted supplement, which, as I said, is possible, there's still no excuse. You're John Jones. You don't get leeway at this point. You don't get second chances at this point you nope. be, that's why i said you better be if you're if you're taking supplements and I'm, I'm not saying you shouldn't take supplements although i personally don't believe in supplements that much if you if you're gonna take supplement in that situation and and you're john jones you had the money to do it you better be testing these products thoroughly the most Thor yeah, you better be most. sending them to the lab and paying for i know it's expensive but you better be doing all that because otherwise you run the risk of this happening because guess what now we're talking about a john jones who potentially could be suspended for four years. And at that point, is that a career killer? Not necessarily. He's 30 years old. He could but come back at 34. pretty damn close, man. But it's pretty damn close. I mean, yeah. at this point, you know what I mean? 34, if, 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 let's just say hypothetically it is four years. I mean, the sport moves on without him. Daniel Cormier will not be around in four years. Yeah, guys like Matt Brown are calling for him to have a lifetime ban. What do you think about that? I mean... I'm with Matt on, 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 you know, I think second time offenders in a lot of ways, if you get busted for something two times, I think you should probably be banned for life. I just think that, you know, we're in a because sport. Because it's just too egregious, right? Well, I had this conversation with <laughs> Stefan Struve last week. I was talking to <laughs> Stefan Struve. He has a fight coming up next weekend in Rotterdam, and he's a big, big, you know, proponent of drug testing. And he said, you know, and, and this is not something new that he said, but I'm just saying, like, this is just a conversation I recently had with him. It's just kind of coming back up now is that, you know, he's like, we're not hitting a ball. We're not putting a ball into a yep. basket. We're not, you know, we're hitting each other with the intention of knocking each other out. In that kind of a situation, the penalties should be more severe because we are going out there to harm another human being and, you know, brain damage. All these things are real. Look at look at Daniel Cormier. He got knocked out. He didn't remember that. You heard that interview? Yeah. No, he didn't, he didn't remember, even remember he, that happening. He didn't remember 10 minutes of that fight. The last 10 minutes, like, he doesn't remember the interview with Joe Rogan. He doesn't remember getting knocked out. That's brain damage. That's what that is. That's a concussion. That's brain damage he suffered. And if it turns out that John Jones was on steroids, you know what I mean? That's what I'm, that's exactly the problem. That's now, where you I talk. Did, I did talk to my lawyer, and he said that that would be really tough to prove that the steroids was the cause of the knockout. Which it doesn't seem like it would be, but like to physically prove that in a court of law, I guess would well, be really yeah, tough. but we're not even talking about the court of law. I'm just saying like that's when you oh, talk public about, opinion. When, when you talk, well, no, when you talk about the the penalty is what I'm saying, like the penalty for what he's doing. Like, oh, I the, see, yeah, the yeah, end yeah, yeah. result. You know what I mean? Like Daniel Cormier had brain damage from that fight. You know right, what I mean? Right, and, right. And, and he didn't remember ten minutes after the knockout. All those kind of things. 
That's what we're talking about with with and that's yeah. That's why we're so that's why we're so against performance enhancing drugs in this sport is because of that in and of itself. You're going out there to harm another person. You're going out there to literally knock them unconscious, unconscious. And you're on drugs. I mean, like I said, I, I, I'm not. I mean, it's it's kind of like, I mean, you think about it. It's like drinking and driving. Yeah, it is. It is. Really is. Right? It is. Absolutely is. And you're doing it consciously and, and you're out there and you can hurt somebody. And listen, like I said, once again, I want to make it clear. I'm not convicting John Jones because we don't know all the facts yet. He's got to go through the adjudication process. Yet. And there's a chance he could be exonerated. A very slim chance, I would imagine, next to nothing as far as the chance that he's exonerated. But... Like I said, even the accusation at this point is too much for John Jones. You know what I mean? Like, he's just one guy who can't do this. You know what I mean? He needs to be as squeaky clean as anybody in the sport because of all the things he's already done. And it's not, you know, the cocaine, the the hit and run, the, the, the drug testing from last year. I mean, all these things, and it just keeps piling up on him that you, you've got to be the most stringent. You've got to be the most on top of things. I mean, and, and I, I just do don't get it. I mean, do you think that his camp is to blame at all? I mean, do you think that the people that he has around him, I mean, if this is all true and it, and it truly is what everybody thinks it is, like, do you think that uh, Greg Jackson? No. Do you it, think that Winkle jo- I mean, like any of those guys have any sort of blame that they can take themselves? No, I think if John, if John wants to, you know, if John finds out, let's just say hypothetically it's a tainted supplement, okay. then, you know, then he needs to find out, you know, who was giving him that tainted supplement. Was it a coach? Was it a, was it a manager? Was it a teammate? You know what? Those kind of things. But ultimately, you know, John Jones can place the blame where he wants personally, professionally or or from a standpoint of of his career there's no one to blame but himself there's no one to blame but him i don't care if if i don't care if if and greg jackson let me let me just say this is one of the most honorable dudes in this sport i i love greg jackson and that's why i i'm just using this as an example i don't care if greg jackson walked up to john jones and handed him a box of supplements and said this stuff is awesome you should take it and John Jones took it, and that's the, that's the one that, that he got popped for. doesn't yeah. matter. John Jones has to be responsible for John Jones. At this point in his career, he can no longer pass the buck at all. Yeah. I mean, and, so when is his uh, contract up? Uh, he he has multiple fights left on his contract. But I mean, so. like, but for a UFC fighter, it doesn't even matter because it's not like you get paid if you don't fight. You well, know? yeah, and the contract just gets extended. I mean, if he gets suspended for four years, his contract just gets extended for four years. I mean, that's all there is to it. That's what happens when you get injured in the UFC. Oh, I didn't when you, realize that. When you that. get injured in the UFC, if they call you and say, hey, I got a fight to offer you, and they're like, I'm injured, I'm not going to be back for six months, your contract gets extended six months. Wow, I had no idea. Yeah. So you, but I understand that. Like, you know what I mean? No, like, they, they get their allotted amount yeah. of Because like, you're not doing it based upon performance of right. years. You're doing right. it based now, upon that's why in a different situation, like Chris, when Chris Cyborg was coming up at the end of her contract after her fight with Tanya Evinger. Her contract ran out in October. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure they're going to get a new deal done with her. That's not my point. But hers was different because her contract was just, there is a, there is a time, you have, they have so many fights in such a period of time for a contract. Hers was coming up to the end in October with like one fight remaining. So they either have to get her a fight before October or after October her contract would expire. Uh, if she if they called her and said, "Hey, we have a fight for you in uh, in October," and she said, "I'm injured, I can't take the fight," right? Then that two month window, let's just say hypothetically, would then get tacked on the end of her contract. But that's not the case in her situation. But in John Jones or any other fighter situation, yes, if you're injured and you're out, that just extends your contract based on the amount of time that you're actually out. So John Jones gets gets suspended for four years. He's under contract. He's just suspended for four years. I mean, when he when he decides to come back, if he decides to come back and get his shit together, right? Then they would just boom, your contract's reinstated. You know what I mean? Like that. It's the same thing like what George St. Pierre did. And George St. Pierre left, he still had fights left on his contract. He retired or quote unquote just you know went on a sabbatical. Right. When he came back, his contract is just, you know, re- reinstated like that. Now he worked out a new deal, of course, and that's a whole other story. But yeah, so he's gonna stay under contract. So John Jones will not be able to like suddenly decide he's going to go to Ryzen and fight in Japan or something. You know what I mean? Like he's under suspension and he's under contract to the UFC. He's going to sit for a year, two years. However long you saw to put him on the shelf is how long he's going to be on the shelf. Pretty crazy stuff, man. Once again, if you have not heard, John Jones has been accused of taking a tainted supplement or at least well no he has they said they're john jones statement says he's crushed by the news and they're going to do some investigating into you know how this happened he's saying tainted supplement i'm just saying that i i think that's probably going to be the route he's going to take but doesn't mean it's true i'm just saying all we know for sure 
John Jones tested positive from a test taken on July 28th. Yeah. And the drug that was that was found was Terenobol, which is an anabolic steroid. That's all we know. Now, like I said, court of public opinion is, go- is going to crucify him. But I'm just saying that anything else, tainted supplement, we don't know tainted supplement. Yeah. You know what I mean? It could have been injections for all I know. Uh, but that's what we know for sure. It was a steroid. It was Terenobol. It was July 28th was the test. And as of, the, as of right now, John Jones is provisionally suspended pending the outcome of the USADA. And also, the California State Athletic Commission will have a say in this also because uh, just like when, uh, you know, when Nevada – uh, you know, with, with Brock Lesnar and John Jones around UFC 200, they held a you know they held a meeting and they ultimately suspended John the exact same one year. They'll have a say in this as well. And California State Athletic Commission, Andy Foster, they don't play. So, uh, yeah, he could, like I said, I have a hard time believing he's going to get less than two years. I think in this particular situation, because it is a second time offender, he could be looking at four. All right, what about this uh, Frank Lester? Have you heard about this? I did. I heard. All right. About so he's that. one of he's at the Jackson Wink Gym, yeah. and he's one of uh, John Jones's training partners. And he believes this was all a setup. He said he was with John Jones at the time of the phone call when it came in at dinner. Yeah. And John Jones was blown away. I mean, he's his teammate. Of course, he's going to defend he said him. John was devastated. Of course, he's going to defend him, and he should. He's his teammate. I get it. I don't. I don't fault him for that. You know what I mean? Like. If they, if they ever accused you of doing PEDs on our show, I would definitely uh, I'd get you back, bro. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I get it. I understand it. Did they set him up, though? No. I mean, come on. This uh, is all random testing. Like, you know. ju- Damon juices before every show, just everybody. Knows. Yeah, I do. I do. I got the <laughs> got the needle right over here. No, oh, when really? they when that. they do the, the when they do juice, when, when they do the testing, uh, when they do the testing, uh, it's all you know. They take the test and the test is done randomly. It's Why don't they number. release it before the fight? Then it's well, it, it takes, weird, man. It takes What's up time. With that? It takes you can't. so then you need to do it farther out. I think. Well, no, right? they did. They did test him further out, but they 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 have to. No one no one can blame Usada for this situation, and no one can get mad at them for the result coming out after the fight. They took the test on July 28th. There was no conceivable way they were going to get a test back in 24 and hours. It's always like this. It's always, but they take the test for this reason. They take the test three weeks out, a month out, six weeks out, two weeks out, a day of. They do all this because they want to be stringent and they can't skip something. You know what I mean? Like, it sucks for Daniel Cormier and it sucks for the result of that fight that John was allowed to fight, but it's not USADA's fault. Actually, we should be applauding USADA for making sure they're still testing him right up to the fight because otherwise we may not know this. You know what I mean? If they test him a week out, who knows? You know what I mean? Maybe it doesn't show up. I don't know. Like I said, I'm not I'm not a uh, you know, a, a steroid expert. I feel like one these days. Uh, but that's what I'm saying. Like, you can't you can't fault them. It's not their fault that the, the test didn't come back in time because if they tested him a week and a half before, which I'm sure they probably did, if you look at his drug testing history, they test him pretty constantly like all athletes. Uh, it may not have come back. And when people say, well, why didn't it show up? If you've never done, if you've never seen the the, the science behind performance enhancing drugs uh, and, and masking the drugs and, and, you know, all these different things that happen, that just because he passed the test two weeks before. It's like a whole other sport. Yeah, just because you, <laughs> just a- because he passed the test two weeks before doesn't mean he's going to pass the test two weeks later and, and that drug's not going to show up. You know what I mean? Like uh, Anderson Silva, when he got busted. I don't busted- know, bro. I was at dinner, okay, <laughs> and I saw John Jones. He was going to order dessert, and then he didn't. Why not, Damon? Why do you not think so? I think it's because he's upset, bro. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, it's it's not good. All I can say is it's not good. You, you test positive for steroids, it's never oh going to be good. One of my fucking heroes is gone. This is it, man. I mean, I think a lot of people feel this way. Uh, listen, John Jones, everybody was – it got so bad for him in, in for the younger fans. Maybe they don't even remember. Like, when this all first started with John – Everybody was against him, and then the public opinion then swayed back with him, and then everybody wanted to support him. That's why all this booing of DC, everybody was, you know, was like, "What's going on with that? He's an American hero, you know, guy does the right thing." What? Because John, everybody loves a good story. Yeah. Everybody loved Rocky. Everybody loves the come from behind story. Oh, you're gonna count John out? Not today. Everybody wanted to support him, and now with this. I got to say this is too much. I mean, for me personally, speaking only for myself, if this comes out 100% true, I, I'm i done, man. I can't support you anymore. Yeah, it's a tough situation. And I mean, I, you know, you're a great fighter, but well, that's what what's I said. real? I, what's not like, real? I that, And that's why I said I feel sympathy for the situation, for the people that support John. And, and I, like I said, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm best friends with John by any stretch of the imagination, but I do know him. I've interviewed him dozens of times. 
Uh, John's a nice guy, and John, you know, I think John is is deep down. I think he's he's a he's a good dude, but. Um, when you interviewed him, did you get the sense that in the future he would be sorry for this? <laughs> yeah. I'm just wondering. Um, well, that's what, all, like I said, you know, at some point sympathy goes away is my point. You know, at some point sympathy goes away. You can be the nicest guy in the world, but if you cheat and you get caught, that's it. I mean, there's just nothing, there's no other way around it. There's no justifying it. Not and a like, lot of wives will let you cheat three times. Yeah. And so that, and that's, <laughs> what, and that's why I said at some point you have to take some personal responsibility. Yes, it could be a tainted supplement. Absolutely. It could be. I know from doing research that this drug has shown up in other supplements. But the problem is, like I said, last time I'll say this if you're John Jones, you can't take that chance. So do you, uh, this John Jones Brock Lesnar fight is a nightmare. There's it's, no way. Obviously, that's not going to happen. But like, even when he came back, if somehow Brock Lesnar is going to be over 40 years old at that point. But let's say it did happen, right? I mean, like the press around that event would be terrible. Yeah, with Brock having tested positive, Jones testing positive, it would be bad. Pride I mean, people, rules. People would still watch. People would still watch. <laughs> but, yeah, I think at this point that fight is off the table. I mean, John Jones, like I said, he's looking at, I would say, a minimum of a year suspension, probably looking more likely between two and four years for a suspension, and like you said, Brock Lesnar's 40. He's a freak athlete, don't get me wrong, but he's yeah, not but sticking around for four years. So. Unless we're going to go pride rules. That's yeah. the only way to do this. John Jones notified a potential anti-doping violation, and we're following the story as uh, the story does develop. Maymac happens this weekend. Everybody, I mean, like, before this, that's all <laughs> anyone could talk about. Like, mixed martial arts, like, oh, really? Are there fights coming up? Like that, you know, people are are acting like they're blind. This Conor McGregor Floyd Mayweather thing obviously has stolen the show. Yeah, and so that's why today our first guest is uh, actually one of the guys calling the fights for Sky Sports in uh, in Europe. A former UFC welterweight title contender, Dan Hardy. Uh, when I was doing my preview for this show for this fight, I said, "There's two guys I want to get on the podcast. I want to get Dominic Cruz and I want to get Dan Hardy. Two guys I truly respect." I said guys Dan who, Hardy and the Iron Sheik, but we'll, we saw what happened. Yeah, I I, I vetoed the Sheik. I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, but yeah, Dan Hardy, smart guy, very intelligent guy, great analyst, uh, and I think a guy that would be uh, a candidate. You know, Brian Stan left the UFC this week. Yeah, dude. Um, oh, I I would love Dan Hardy to get that. Now. Yeah, I, Dan Hardy would be a great choice for that. So let's let's talk to Dan Hardy because he had some great insights, and he's going to be part of the team calling the fights in Europe for Sky Sports. So I was like, well, who better who better to break down McGregor and Mayweather than Dan Hardy? With one of the biggest fights of the year coming up just days away, Conor McGregor takes on Floyd Mayweather, and one of the people who will be calling the fight and helping to break down the fight for Sky Sports in England, one of my favorite people and one of the best analysts in the sport, former welterweight title contender Dan Hardy. Dan, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for taking the time. We really do appreciate it. No problem, man. Always good talking to you. So, Dan, uh, let me first say, you know, obviously it's got to be exciting. I mean, you've been working as an analyst for quite some time. Uh, how excited were you to uh, to get the call and, uh, you know, be able to actually work this fight card for Sky Sports? Oh, I was, I was, I'm incredibly excited. I'm very surprised, to be honest. I, I was, uh, I'd not even, I'd not even thought about it. Um, I, I've been doing a few things for different, you know, betting companies and, and uh, obviously other broadcasters, BT Sport, who showed the UFC. Uh, a lot of people are very, obviously very interested in this. Um, so I've been, I've been talking a lot about it and after I did an interview for Sky and they approached me a couple of days after when, when they realized that they were going to be able to show the fight. Um, I, and I'm, I, I think it's great that they're diversifying their broadcast team. Obviously, they've got you know great experts in Johnny Nelson and uh, and Carl Froch for boxing, but this is a special event, and I, and I think in order for it to be represented righteously, they they need someone from the MMA community. Um, I, I, and I'm I just I'm very fortunate to be in the position where I'm the guy they call. Yeah, well, I think you do a phenomenal job. I know I've told you that numerous times. I was super excited to see you on this broadcast. So, Dan, let me let me start with this because I know you do a lot of studying, you know, for your broadcasting and mixed martial arts. How much studying have you already done for this fight? Because there's so many angles to this fight beyond just it being boxer versus mixed martial artist and just Connor against Floyd. I mean, there's so many angles to this fight, in my opinion. But there are, and that's what makes it so interesting. And I, honestly, I could spend all day, every day researching it. Um, I've, I've obviously been going through Floyd's record. Um, I, I've watched the, well, the majority of his fights. Um, all, all of the ones that are, are very relevant to this fight, I've watched them a couple of times at least, and I've made loads of notes. And um, I mean, I've always, I've always been a, I'm always been a boxing fan. I've always been a Floyd Mayweather fan. He's a, he's a fantastic technician. Um, but. With Connor, obviously, I'm so familiar with his career. I've always fight before, and 
um, I'm, I'm so immersed in mixed martial arts that the, the Conor McGregor story kind of stayed into my subconscious. So all I do with Conor now is consume uh, just new, new information, new stuff that's coming out, anything that's posted, any interviews, any videos, any photos, what, whatever's going on. I just consume that. Where with Floyd Mayweather, I went right back to Pretty Boy, and I've kind of started going through some of his older fights and, and watching his development and seeing how he how he handles guys that are you know uh, bigger than him, faster than him, unpredictable. Uh, don't show any respect for his boxing ability. But there are so many interesting fights on his record that there's. I mean, it's, it's really a feast for me for, as an analyst. Yeah. Let me start with this question, Dan, because in a lot of ways, you know, being the representative of mixed martial arts, quote unquote, you know, going into this fight, you're going to answer the same question a million times over. So I'm just going to get it out of the way right now. When you look at this breakdown, when you look at Floyd and you look at Connor, give me the way, in your opinion, that Connor can win this fight. Because let's be honest, he is a massive underdog. A lot of people are counting him out. I don't think I've heard one boxing analyst yet say they give him much of a chance to win. So from your expertise, Tell me, how does Conor McGregor win this fight? Okay, well, what I would say, if I was in his corner, I would say, look, Floyd's expecting you to get caught up in the moment. He's expecting you to be, uh, you know, to have a, a massive adrenaline dump because obviously you handle the pressure very well in mixed martial arts. But in Floyd's mind, stepping into a Mayweather promotion is a very, very different thing. And he always commands that space as he's expecting to on, on the night as well. So, the, the, the counteraction to that is to actually not come out like a bull in a china shop and just throw, go and do, do a, a Marcus Maidana and just throw 300 punches at him. Because that's what Floyd's expecting. That's what he's almost banking on because that's how he finds his way into the fight a little bit later on. As we know, you know, as we've seen in, in the past, Connor does have somewhat of a drop off because he is such a power puncher. And Floyd going on the, the limited research that he can do, if he's done any, looking at, at, at McGregor's fights, he'll be looking for that moment where Connor's thrown his best punches and then Floyd starts to find his way into the fight. So what I do as an analyst, I, I look at the first approach and then at every time there's a counter, I reverse engineer it. And what it brings me to is for Connor to go, okay, first four rounds, I'm going to start off nice and steady. I'm going to command the center of the ring and I'm going to show him that I'm the bigger man. I'm going to show him that I have no respect for his power. I'm not really bothered if he hits me too much because I, don't, I know he doesn't have the power to hurt me. And when I throw, I'm going to throw a lot of power into the shots that I throw. And I'm just going to hit whatever's there. I'm going to you know, give him 80% power. I'm going to hit his shoulders, his gloves, his arms, his body, whatever's available. If I can clinch him, I'm going to lean on him. I'm going to make him carry my weight. But I'm not going to fight with a ferocious pace like he did in the Diaz fights. When he first came out, and he was just chasing the knockout immediately because that's how he plays into Floyd Mayweather's game plan. So first three or four rounds, I'd start to, you know, I'd, I'd make Floyd realize that this is not a Floyd Mayweather promotion. This is very much a, a shared promotion, and Conor McGregor's coming in there as a legitimate contender. From that point onwards, then he needs to start picking up his pace. And if he decides he's going to go on the offensive, he's got to, he's got to throw... Uh, multiple punch combinations so he keeps Floyd on the defensive because he's not necessarily going to outbox uh, Floyd Mayweather but he can outpunch him you know it, uh, um, th there's been a few comments by uh, 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 Abel Sanchez that's the, that's the name I'm, I'm searching for Gennady Golovkin's uh, coach a quote uh, that he mentioned was very interesting he said um, he needs to punch he needs to be in, in shape to punch constantly for three minutes now, we know that Connor can't do that from the first bell. He can't maintain that over 36 minutes. So if he can start the first four rounds at a steady pace and then start to pick his pace up, he narrows that option for, he narrows that opportunity for, for Floyd to win the later rounds because then there are fewer later rounds. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So, so instead of coming out like the aggressive fighter that Floyd's expecting and giving Floyd a hellish four rounds before he drops off and gets beaten up for eight, which is the safe money, if we're honest, I, I, would, I would be the, the smarter person in there. I would kind of take my time and force Floyd to come out of his defensive shell a little bit and maybe take a few chances early on in the, in the fight, which he's not wanting to do. He's definitely not wanting to do that because he's a studier. He's the person that that gets in there, and for those first three or four rounds, he allows his opponents to work, and he just pays attention to openings, and, and he watches, and he studies, and 
you know, even previous opponents have said this about him. You know, they, they realized that sometimes in the early rounds they would throw a punch and he would see the opening but not take it. He's registering, he's making notes for the later rounds. So the, the fewer later rounds where Connor's tired, the better. So starting off steady and then picking his pace up to a ferocious pace later in the fight would be my recommendation. Yeah. To that point, Dan, one of the things that I've said numerous times, and you brought up Marcus Maidana because a lot of people have said, you know, that was a fight that kind of surprised Floyd a little bit when a guy, you know, fought him a little a little dirty, or not dirty as in the gameplay, but didn't go in there and just try to outbox him. And I've argued that the way Conor McGregor wins this fight is he can't just try to outbox Floyd Mayweather because that's playing into his game too much. It's like going in and trying to out-wrestle Daniel Cormier or, or trying to out jujitsu, you know, Damian Maya. Could you do it? Potentially, but you're also playing into his game. Do you agree with that, that Conor can't just go in there and try to outbox Floyd Mayweather? He's got to He's got to do something a little different. He's got to, whether it's roughing him up, whether it's, you know, the clinch, whatever it is, I feel like Conor just can't simply go out there and try to outbox Floyd Mayweather because that's that's just not the way he wins his fight. I, I totally agree. I absolutely agree. You know, Floyd's unbeaten in 49 fights, and, and every single one of those 49 opponents that he's fought have been boxers. Now, Conor's not a boxer, and I, and I really hope, and I don't think I give him, I give him enough credit to, to not... I've been, you know, kind of bought into this and thinking he's a boxer because he's most definitely not. Now, in in the build-up to this, there's been a few times that Connor said things that that point to a um, a favourable mindset, you could say, where where he said, you know, uh, I'm a fighter, I'm a real fighter, and he and he hints at the fact that that Floyd's really only kind of playing at combat sports because he's focused on such a narrow skill set. So if Connor realizes that that his uh, the, the the strength of his um, uh, presence in the ring is, is based on that unpredictability. He's based on the fact that he doesn't move like a boxer, that he doesn't throw like a boxer, that he doesn't stand in boxing range. I mean, you know, you've got to think Canelo Alvarez is, is really, you know, was almost in his prime when he fought Floyd. I mean, he's obviously excelled in the last, you know, the last couple of years, but Canelo Alvarez has always been a fantastic boxer when he's been on the world scene. And he stood him in, in, in Floyd's punching range and couldn't keep up with him. And, and he had youth on his side and he had athleticism on his side. Connor can't step in and try and replicate what somebody else has failed to do in the past. It, it would be foolish to do it. He's got to embrace the things that make him special in this contest. And that is the, 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 the covering distance very quickly, fighting outside of Floyd's range, throwing things unpredictably, and, you know, not showing... Like you, you look down Floyd's record, and there are certain performances that stand out. Obviously, the, the, the Marcus Maidana fight is, is one of those things. But Maidana came to the fight, and he, and he brought one thing that troubled Floyd. That one thing was, was reckless aggression. Then you go a bit further down, and there are, there are other people. Miguel Cotto, he brings toughness. connor has got toughness. He's got that reckless aggression if he needs it. But then, you know, you go even further back. I mean, I'm talking way back into his career. You look at someone like uh, Emmanuel Augustus Burton, who brought that, that, that absolute disrespect of his power. Someone that would walk through his punches and still dance and play about and be disrespectful. If Connor can take elements of all of these people that have caused Floyd problems and somehow mold them into one individual, he can certainly cause Floyd all kinds of problems because Floyd has to adapt to Connor. We can we can watch 49 uh, fights of Floyd Mayweather and we can study all of them and we can see how he develops as a boxer. There isn't a single bit of tape that Floyd can watch to see how Connor's a boxer because he's not a boxer. So he needs to embrace all of the things that make him special in this contest and that is the fact that he's not a boxer. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I agree. You know, one other aspect that's been a big part of this, Dan, is the psychological aspect of this fight. You know, we saw it with Connor and Floyd going back and forth on that world tour. But one thing that Floyd said recently, and I understand it's an interview and what guys say in interviews don't always mean how they're going to actually fight. But one thing he did say that, you know, kind of perked up my ears a little bit was when he made the comment that, you know, he doesn't want to go out there and fight a defensive fight because, you know, he wants to make up for the Pacquiao fight. Now, maybe in his head, he thinks Connor is a guy he could pick apart because Connor's not a boxer but when you hear a comment like that and again I understand it's just an interview he may not mean that but when he says he's not going to go out there and try to fight a defensive fight which is kind of the switch over from pretty boy Floyd to money Mayweather where he fought a much more defensive style with that shoulder roll defense and things like that 
Does that, I want to say concern you, but does that play into Connor's favor? If he goes out there and actually doesn't just try to put on a defensive masterpiece and he actually gets aggressive, because that's where Connor has been at his best in his MMA careers when he's counter striking, when guys come after him and he just picks them apart. Yeah, that, I don't think that uh, I don't think that Floyd, particularly in the early rounds, he's going to come out and be any more aggressive than he normally is. I think I think the way he sees Connor is um, he's going to be aggressive early, which means that the first half of the fight will be entertaining because it will be Floyd showing his excellent defensive skills as Connor punches himself out, and then the second half of the fight is where Floyd then makes an example of Connor by outboxing him when Connor's tired. So. I think that that's what Floyd's talking about. He doesn't want to be the defensive boxer, but he, that doesn't mean that he's not going to start defensive. You know, the, the thing that will stick out, if, if, if that's the way it plays out, if Connor has strong, uh, four, uh, four strong rounds and then Floyd dictates the pace for eight and beats him up, people won't really remember the first four rounds. They'll remember how Floyd lit him up. So I, I, I think he's too smart now to, to, to revert back to the pretty boy mindset where he's going to go and try and knock him out. And, and the other thing that supports that is the fact that, well, he's opted for 10 ounce clubs, even though there's, there's all this hot air about going down to eight, which is never going to happen. Um, and and the fact that um, the fact that he's had so many hand problems. I mean, he, in fights when he's gone out there to try and knock people out, and he's failed, he's also hurt his hands in the process. And we can't we can't question Connor's chin. I, I mean, he takes he takes a tremendous shot, and. The only time I, the only way I see Connor getting TKO in here is, is standing against the ropes. You know, is if he punches himself out early in the fight and he's and he's leaned up against the ropes in the seventh, eighth, ninth round. His hands are by his waist. His his mouth open. He's breathing, and Floyd is just peppering him with sixty percent power punches, and the referee just steps in because he's seen enough. I, I don't I don't see a point where I mean Floyd's not a murderous puncher. He never has been. You know, you look down his record and you see the majority of, of, his, of his knockouts and technical knockouts, most of them technical knockouts, were at super featherweight. I mean, you know, you're talking, what, what, what's that, 135? One, maybe even lighter than that? Like, Connor's not been, not, Connor's not been as light as that since he was, what is it? yeah, 130. The limit's 130 at super featherweight. Connor's not been 130 since he was about 12. <laughs> you know what I mean? He, he, he's a big man. He, he's a big athlete. He, he's, he's much. He was too big for featherweight, and the limit for, was that was 45. The ideal weight for him is, is 155 to weigh in, so he can walk in in the ring in the octagon at 164. I, I mean, that's that's a comfortable weight for him. I think. I think he gained weight to 168 for the the Diaz fight. So. I, I, I think uh, I just don't think Floyd feels like he has the power and the weight and the strength of hand to really hurt Connor. So I don't think he will throw with the investment to try and spark him with one punch. Yeah. When we also talk about the psychological aspect of this fight, I mean, I feel like, you know, it's kind of reminds me of the, the days when Anderson Silva was on top of the world. And it seemed like a lot of fighters went in there. I won't say that. I'm not saying they went in there defeated. They didn't go in there to beat him. But there was always this aura around Anderson Silva that when you went in to fight him, it's like, you know, you're already down on the scorecards a little bit because Anderson Silva was such a prolific finisher. Uh, and I feel like maybe some guys did have that aspect with Floyd Mayweather in the latter part of his career. After he beat De La Hoya, it kind of became that point where he was the best and everyone knew he was the best. And it's almost like they, they approached the fight in a certain way and, and maybe they were a little bit beaten, you know, going going into the fight. Connor has such confidence and I truly believe he believes in himself that he can win this fight. I mean, can that help him in this fight? That that confidence and that attitude that you know he doesn't care that he's fighting Floyd Mayweather. He doesn't care that Floyd's 49 and 0 and he certainly doesn't care that you know that Floyd is the favorite. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. This is definitely strength in that mindset. There are a lot of positives coming into this for Connor. One is that He's he's done the unbelievable. He's managed to get Floyd Mayweather to accept a fight against Conor McGregor. Now, I would imagine that Conor a few years ago was a, was a cocky little kid that walked into a boxing gym in in Dublin and said, "I'm going to fight Floyd Mayweather one day," and everyone laughed at him. You know, so he comes in with the strength of the mindset that he's achieved the unbelievable already by just getting to the ring in the first place. The second thing that that, that played out during the uh, the World Tour was that. Floyd Mayweather is used to dictating the way that these things go down. He's used to welcoming his opponents into a Mayweather production. So you're, you're on the stage 
on Floyd Mayweather's stage, you're on Floyd Mayweather's payroll, you're, you know, you're, you're fighting, uh, you're fighting alongside the referee that Floyd Mayweather's chosen. You know what I mean? It's like everything is geared towards the, the whole situation being absolutely controlled by Floyd. And that is the person that he is. He is a control freak and he's mastered the art of controlling in the boxing ring and every aspect around the outside, including all the promotion. Now, what, what I think he often relies on, particularly after the, the Delaware fight, as you pointed it out, is, is that feeling that when his opponents walk into the ring, they're like, oh, damn, I'm fighting Floyd Mayweather. Like, this is all of a sudden a massive deal, far bigger deal than I had anticipated when I was in training camp. And now the shocks hit me, the adrenaline's hit me, and I've kind of froze up and I'm going to fight at Floyd's pace because I don't know what else to do. That happens a lot of the time with some of the best boxers of all time. But what, what played out in the World Tour, and I think what Floyd realized in the World Tour, is that that's not the case at all. When Conor walked on that stage, he owned that stage. When Conor picked up the mic, he owned the mic. And every time Floyd had something to say, Conor made him look silly. And Floyd knows that, regardless of, 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 um, of how confident he is in himself and how much in control he feels in the fact that this is his promotion, he's going to make a load of money out of it he realizes that Connor has no real respect for what Floyd's achieved. And a part of that is based on the fact that it doesn't really matter what happens because at the end of the day, Connor's still the best fighter. And that's ultimately what Connor's most interested in. There's that, there's that safe in the knowledge that, yeah, you might be able to beat me at boxing. You might be able to beat me at tennis or at chess or at whatever. But in a fight, you don't stand a chance. Yeah, there's so, there's so many angles to this fight, and I think that's what makes it so intriguing. I mean, Floyd coming back from retirement two years away, uh, you know, and I, I said this in the lead-up to the fight. I said, you know, being away for two years is one thing. Being away for two years when you're retired is a different thing. I mean, there's just so many angles that you can take on this fight, and I love it. And I know a lot of people are discounting Connor and saying he has no chance, but I am seriously intrigued by every aspect of this fight, and I truly believe, and it's not because I'm an MMA guy, I truly believe Connor has a chance to shock the world and I think it's more than just like he caught Floyd with one punch and he finishes him I, I legitimately think Connor has has a shot in this one I, I think it would be unreasonable to think the thing that he's not and it surprises me that there are so many intelligent people out there that are just writing him off um, you, you know I mean obviously the, the safe bet is, is Mayweather by decision but that's always the safe bet I mean you look at odds in any of his fights and that's the one that returns the least money because well, uh, it's a Floyd Flo Mayweather fight. Of course, he's not been by his. That's, that's kind of his MO. Uh, so it, it, it's different in this one because you know Connor's Connor's a, an unpredictable uh, element. He's a he's a um, he he's stepping in from outside of the boxing world. He's even been referred to in the boxing news um, as, as the barbarian at the gate, which I love. I think he's a, he's a, he's a fascinating uh, uh, perspective from the boxing community because. There's an intrigue there. Yeah, they're writing him off. But what's, what's interesting is that, you know, if, if Floyd Mayweather was talking about crossing over to mixed martial arts, we wouldn't, people, we're not interested because he's going to get James Toned because, of course, he is. There's no other outcome. There's, there's no other way that that could go down. But Connor stepping into the boxing ring, now there's a question, and people want to know what the answer to that question is. And, and no matter how con convinced people are, they know the answer to that question, they still will admit that there's enough of a question for the fight to take place. Yeah, I agree. Dan, I, I can't wait for this one. I know I can only imagine how excited you are. I'm sure you're going to be breaking down a lot of video and footage over the next couple of weeks. I know you're going to be excited to be a, a part of the broadcast, which is why I'm, I'm not officially asking you for your prediction because obviously you got to work the broadcast, so you got to stay above board with that. But I look forward to hearing your call. Uh, congrats on all the success, man. I know I tell you this a lot on Twitter, but just in all seriousness, you've done, just done a fantastic job in your analyst uh, work, and I just want to say I'm, I'm really excited that you're going to be part of this broadcast. I think you're going to bring a very unique – and, uh, and really great perspective to this fight. And I cannot wait to see this August 26th. I know everyone's excited. I'm sure you're uh, you're just over the moon ready to do this thing. Um, absolutely beside myself. Uh, I will be uh, I will be giving it my every effort. And I will be, be trying to do my best out there on the mic. Um, yeah, very privileged to be a part of it. And uh, always good talking to you, my friend. Thank you for your kind words. All right. Well, I appreciate it, Dan. We'll talk to you after the fight. As I said, I'll preview it now. We're going to have you on after the fight to kind of break down everything that happened. But look for you on Sky Sports Saturday night, August 26th. Dan, thank you so much again for the time, and we will talk soon. Thank you, my friend. Speak right. to you again. Bye-bye. 
awesome conversation. It's Loper and Damon Martin. Check us out. You can always communicate with us on any social media, Instagram. Hit us up on Twitter, Facebook. We're everywhere. Yeah, we have a Fight Society uh, page on Facebook you can like. We do. Yeah, just check us out. Use the hashtag uh, Fight Society, and then you can hit us up individually on Instagram, Twitter, all that good stuff. At Damon Martin, at Jeremy Loper. So, what do you think uh, is going on here with this headline that the NSAC had, uh, had to explain why the UFC co-promotes Maymac. Uh, What's going on with that? It's it's, it's it's If I'm not mistaken, it's something to do with the fighter being paid. It has to do with Connor being paid because Connor's under contract to Zufa, and Zufa is the one technically paying him for the contract. So I think that's Bob why. Bennett is the guy's name yeah, from the Nevada the, the Athletic executive Commission. executive director, yeah. yeah. Um, did, uh, did he take uh, Jeff's place? Is that is that who uh, took no, over the Jeff, job? Jeff, no, no, he, no, no. He, he, Bob Bennett took over for... Oh my God! I'm trying to remember who it Bob was. Bob Bennett sounds like a uh, car dealer. No, Come to I, Bob Bennett Chevrolet. No, it was Keith Kaiser was his name. Keith, Keith Kaiser. Yeah, Keith Kaiser was there before, and then Bob Bennett took over. Yeah, Jeff Nowitzki has never been commissioned. Jeff Nowitzki was the guy who was like the special prosecutor for the whole uh, with the government when they took down Lance Armstrong. Uh, hey, everybody! Bob Bennett, Bob Bennett, Jeff Kaiser in the morning. <laughs> Bob Bennett Chevrolet. Bob Bennett Chevrolet, Jeff Kaiser. <laughs> so, I put a roll after myself. Yeah, so uh, it's, uh, it's a crazy world, my friend. Yeah, so we so we have in a few minutes. We're going to talk to Artem Lobov, who yes. is Connor's teammate. And he's going to break down some of this drama between Connor and Paulie Malinaji, which I'm sure you saw Dude. yesterday. They got into a confrontation. So it was so funny. I saw a meme. Uh, they said fan gets arrested for rushing into Connor's face, <laughs> and it's a picture of security pushing back Malinaji. <laughs> um, yeah, I said this yesterday, and I stand by it. Uh, I did. Uh, I did Sirius XM, which, by the way, I was so freak. I was so geeking out. They had me on Sirius XM yesterday to talk, and uh, and I was on the show, the new show. There's a new show called MMA Tonight with uh, AJ Hawk, mm-hmm. Ohio State great AJ oh, Hawk. Cool. He's doing a, a MMA a MMA radio show now. Oh yeah, and like in my head, I'm geeking out because AJ Hawk is interviewing me, and like you know, yeah, that's he, awesome. You know, man. my Ohio State yeah, love. So no I, doubt, we're man. in Columbus, Ohio, for Christ's sake. So, that's sick. Uh, so I was I was definitely geeking out about that. Uh, but we were talking about this on the show, and I said, you know, they were asking me, you know, do I think Paulie Malignaggi should still work the broadcast? And I said, no. And listen, I like Paulie Malignaggi as a broadcaster. He's a tremendous, uh, tremendous analyst. But at this point, when you're when you're getting into a fight week confrontation with one of the guys you're supposed to be calling the fight for, you can't. You're not. Bi- you're not unbiased. <laughs> you're not objectionable. You're 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 you're. Are you clearly have an opinion? And, and in my opinion, Paulie's angling for a fight with Connor. Um, you can't be involved with that. So I don't want to cost the guy's job. I'm not saying the guy should be fired. I'm just saying don't put him on this broadcast because the fight's not about him. It's about Floyd and Connor. That's what I want to talk about right now. I want to talk about Floyd and Connor. I want to get our picks. And I want to I want to I want to make our predictions as we as we close out the show today. So you uh, really think that Polly Malinashi thinks that he has a shot to box Floyd Mayweather? Or to, like, obviously they're not going to do to it. To box uh, Connor McGregor. Yeah, oh, sorry. That's what I meant. Yeah. No, absolutely. 100%. He's already said he would come out of retirement for it. Oh, no, but it, so that's supposing Connor loses to Floyd. Yeah, you know because I mean if he, if he beats already. if he beats Floyd, why would he ever even he wouldn't even speak to Malinaji? No, again. if he loses to Floyd, Malinaji would still be an attractive fight and it would still make a lot of money. Paulie's super pissed. You know what I'm saying? Or this is all a big work for the fight. I mean, because it does well, it does the, make it a little more sexy, doesn't well, it? Well, it, well, that's the problem. It draws more interest, right? I mean, in Polly, remember the girl? What was the fighter that? Uh, remember the girlfriend thing? Yo, that's my side piece. That's my side piece. Remember the Polly Malinaji uh, promo oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that he cut? And he was, dude. He is so hilarious in that segment. If you guys have never seen that before, it's him explaining uh, one of the fights that he had uh, against his opponent. They the guy supposedly stole his girlfriend, <laughs> and he was making the point that yo. That's you could take my side piece. The side piece don't mean it. it's just amazing to listen to him talk about a side piece. It's like he's at Kentucky Fried Chicken. Yeah, but the problem the problem is is that like I said at the end of the day, um, this fight is about Connor and Floyd, and with Pauly being involved, you're making it about Connor and Pauly, and that's not. I mean, listen, people, the people who are going to buy the pay per view have probably already made up their minds right now whether or not they're going to buy the pay per view on Saturday night between Floyd and Connor, but. There's still a fight to be had. If they want to have this confrontation and they want to have this moment, they want to have this building to or towards a potential fight, great. 
Do it after Saturday night, though. You know what I mean? I understand they're building the blocks for it already. I get it. But we've already done that. We've done that for weeks now. It doesn't need to happen on fight week, is my point. Fight week is about Connor and Floyd. Let's get through this fight, and then we can worry about Pauli Malignaggi. And, and him, you know, he said he went up to confront Connor's manager is why he did it. But Connor's manager is standing right next to Connor. What did he think? Connor's going to be like, oh, oh no, he hold it. on, hold on. No, let me step knows. out of the way and let you guys have a meeting. Yeah, Sorry he, about that. You know, Pauly took a beating in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. I mean, you know, they ran him through the mud. I don't think, even in boxing, I don't think he's seen a promoter as aggressive as Dana White. Yeah. and, Con- and- I mean, Dana White comes at you. Like, yeah. come at me, bro. No, okay, he will. <laughs> I mean, like, but that's and that's so that's my point. I like Pauly. Pauly's really good at his job, but at this point, I think Pauly, so too, man. But at this point, you know, somebody brought that up to me. They're like, because John, because Daniel Cormier called John Jones' fight against Open St. Pru, and obviously, you know, he said some words afterwards. But I said, great, that's that's fine. But Daniel Cormier didn't go up and get into a fight week confrontation with John Jones. He didn't interrupt John Jones's media scrum to come in there and get face to face with him and, and confront him. You know what I right, mean? Right. Pauly did. And that's what I said. I, you can't. It's just because what's going to happen on the broadcast is this. They're going to talk to Paulie about Connor and he's going to talk about their sparring session. And he's going to say, you know, they're going to say, why did you, you know, what happened on what happened on Tuesday? I don't want to hear about that right now. This is about Floyd and Connor. I don't want to hear about Paulie Malignaggi's beef with Connor. If Connor loses, then we can talk all day about Paulie Malignaggi and Connor McGregor happening at some point in the future in a boxing match. But right now, I don't care about Paulie Malignaggi. I care about Floyd Mayweather and Connor McGregor. This is the biggest fight of the year, and somehow this guy has kind of you know, wedged his way into the conversation. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think that uh, Dana White and Conor McGregor had some something to do with that too, and and even Conor, like the way he just kind of dismissed him, was I mean, I, I thought that was well the right thing to do, man, because you know, like in that situation, you can't pay too much mind to him because then everybody's going to be like, oh, well, you know, you see it firsthand, you know, Conor's distracted, he's not even concentrating on Floyd. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing with Conor too. Also, you have to remember, uh, Conor. When when this whole thing happened, when Paulie flipped out and started doing mi- you know a million interviews, he put out that statement. I left Connor's camp. Blah blah blah. Connor yeah. didn't say a word. Connor didn't put out a tweet. Connor didn't put anything on Instagram. Connor didn't respond. The only time Connor responded was when someone directly asked him at that media day he did last week, and they said, you know, what what's going on with Paulie's situation? And that's when he erupted and said, you know, it's concussion talk and all that stuff. And <laughs> he was barely stumbling out of the car, you know, getting out of the sparring <laughs> session and stuff. Um, that's when that's when he addressed it. But until then, he didn't. If he really, if this, if Paulie was really annoying him, he would have said something. Connor's a social media guy. He knows. Oh no, totally. You but know? but I, I will say Connor has become a little more untouchable during this fight. You well, know what yeah, I'm but that's he like, should be. And he exactly. But I'm just saying, you know, like before, you could kind of call him out and maybe get a response. But I think that Connor has. He's up to the level because well, now that opponent, Floyd Mayweather, already beaten this guy. Why do I need to talk to that? Well, guy? That's, and that's why that's why I think Connor is, is you know Connor's Connor will address Paulie, but ultimately if Connor beats Floyd Mayweather, Paulie just might as well just you know forget that he's ever going to get anywhere near Conor McGregor at that point because if he beats Floyd Mayweather, what? No offense to Paulie Malignaggi, but what are you gaining by fighting a guy who's been retired for for a year and a half? Off of a loss, if I'm not mistaken, Paulie's coming off a loss at the end of his career. What do you gain from that? My like, take on this is, I think it's a bit of a work too. I think that Paulie's in on it a little bit. I think that he's doing a little trash talking to draw more attention to the fight because I think there's only so much trash talking that Connor and Floyd can do. And they did so much leading up to this fight on that world tour, but I really believe in the promotion machine that is a component added with Pauli Malignaggi there because you get Brendan Schaub. He's able to talk about this a little bit because he's doing some of the setups with uh, Pauli Malignaggi. So, I mean, he knows him. He can have him on his show. The drama gets stirred up. Now you have Connor, you have Dana, you got everybody talking about it. It's another guy, but he represents the boxing world, and he'll also be a voice on Fight Night, as you pointed out. Yeah, I just, like I said, I want to talk about Connor Floyd, but if we want to, if we want to hear a perspective on this, I asked uh, Artem Lobov, who was at the sparring session, who was one of the sparring partners. Now, obviously, he's Connor's one of Connor's best friends, and he's Connor's teammate. So, of course, he's going to be a little biased, just like we're talking about Pauly being biased. But I asked him about the situation with Pauly Malignaggi, what happened, what was the sparring session like, and also asked him how Connor's doing in training. So, uh, let's talk to Artem Lobov, see what he had to say, and then we come back, we can uh, give our final picks and predictions. Oh, I can't wait for Mayweather McGregor. Artem Lobov and DM one-on-one. Artem, 
What's up, buddy? Oh, good, man. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me, man. I appreciate it. Nah, it's all good. It's all good. So, uh, how how is everything out in Vegas, man? Obviously, uh, time is uh, is ticking away until uh, Connor gets back in the uh, in the ring, and I know you've uh, you've been out there and helping him out. Yeah, it's been great. You know, the camp has been very good. You know, I, I say it, it almost feels like all the previous camps have been uh, in preparation for this one because uh, we had a chance to get everything right, and, and now this time everything has just gone very smooth and perfect. And Connor is in great shape and ready to do the business August twenty sixth. Yeah, you've been sparring and training with Connor for years right now, but but kind of give me a sense of how it's been different helping him, you know, for a boxing match. I mean, obviously you guys have sparred, you know, dozens of times, but but how has it been for you helping him get ready for a boxing match this time around? Um, well, obviously it's different, but it's a, it's a different sport, you know. Um, and we had a lot more sparring partners this time than uh, than we normally would have. Um, and there was obviously a lot more sparring as well than we would have. We almost kind of have gone to back to the old way, the way it used to be. We, you know, spar a lot more, and because uh, the best way to get good at something is by doing it. So, um, you know, if you're able to to spar safely, if you're able to spar and not take any damage, then why not do more of it? You know, the only reason to not spar as much as if you're getting caught with shots and you are taking damage, then of course it becomes dangerous. But you know, corner doesn't uh, doesn't really get hit, doesn't take any damage, so we were able to implement a lot more sparring into this camp. Yeah. How has it been, you know, welcoming some of the new folks into the camp? I mean, you guys have such a, a close, tight-knit crew with yourself and obviously Owen Roddy and John Cavanaugh and some of the other guys, but you brought in some other, you know, training partners like Tiernan Bradley. Uh, obviously, you brought in Deshaun Johnson some other people. I mean, how has it been kind of opening up the camp a little bit uh, to some new people considering you guys are, you know, you guys are a pretty close-knit team? Uh, yeah, you know, it's always very good uh, to, to bring in new people for sparring, people that you don't know, uh, because it makes it a lot closer to to that fight feeling that you get. You know, when you don't know the guy, you have to just start your sparring and you, and you just have to break him down uh, within that spar and, and defeat him. Uh, and that's exactly what we did. That's why we brought in all these new uh, sparring partners uh, for Connor to, to really, you know, challenge Connor and give him that fight, uh, fight feeling. And, uh, and he's done great. Yeah, I know, obviously, and we're going to talk about your fight career in a second, Arden, but I know that, you know, you took time out to make sure you came to Vegas and obviously you know, started the camp in Ireland with Connor. How important was it for you to, you know, to, to be there with Connor, you know, for this kind of a fight? Because I, you know, I heard the rumors that, you know, you, you basically kind of set aside your own, your own career for a little while, you know, so you could, so you could help him get ready for this one. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, Connor is is always there for me. He has been there for me from the start. You know, he he is the reason I am in the UFC, uh, and I never hide that. So how could I how could I not be there for him? How could I not uh, help him? You know, uh, uh, in the most important fight fight of his life. Um, so yeah, I just I had to turn down the fight um, against Andrew Feely that I was offered on sort of a short enough notice, but you know that wasn't even that was a no brainer for me. That was a very easy decision that I had to make there. Um, yeah, and, and it's been good. You know, I, I'm delighted that I have done that because not only am I helping Connor, but you know this is also great for me. Uh, you know, I, I had a chance to work on, on just my boxing skills. It's not often as an MMA fighter you get a chance to just concentrate on a certain skill set. You know, you always have to sort of go back and forth between all the other disciplines. Whereas now I was able to concentrate on, uh, on uh, boxing, which was great. Yeah, absolutely. So, Artem, there's a lot I want to talk to you about with the fight with, with, with Floyd Mayweather because you've been right in the thick of it. But let me ask you, let me just get this out of the way right now since we're talking Give me your sense of, of, of this whole situation with Pauli Malignaggi coming into camp and sparring with Connor a couple times, then leaving, and the whole controversy. We saw the videos that came out last week. Dana White released them. Dana White has said numerous times now that you know it was a pretty one-sided affair. You were there, Artem. You're one of the guys kind of on the inside. As much as you want to talk about it or can talk about it, can you give me a sense of you know what your impression was of Pauli Malignaggi for those couple of times he came into camp? Um, you know, no, I honestly feel that he was just not able to take it. You know, he, he got he got better up and sparring and, uh, and he just wasn't able for it. You know, he then saw a chance. He didn't want uh, any more of this. 
and he just saw a chance for escape and he took it you know he saw that the one he ran for it and then came out with all this stuff saying that oh i was mistreated and this and that but the truth is he just got slapped around and he didn't want any more of that and that's why he left uh you know he tried to make up stories about the house being bad and the conditions being bad look they were put into a, a nice enough house it, it wasn't a mansion or anything it, it, it wasn't a, uh you know like a luxury or anything but it was a very good house you know a livable house they were given a nice car they were provided with three meals a day from a restaurant they didn't even have to cook they weren't even asked to cook they were provided with meals from a restaurant uh, and they were all uh, paid so look at the other sparring partners they're all happy they were with us in ireland and they were so happy that they came back here to las vegas as well because uh, uh you know they get treated so well and plus all the exposure that they get for this uh but poorly obviously you know i think that's a boxing thing you know in boxing if you're in camp it's all about you you know they very rarely train as teams as part of a team whereas in mma this is something we're well used to uh, and i feel uh, he just couldn't hack it that it wasn't all about him um, and that's what happened there yeah without giving too much detail because at the end of the day connor's getting ready for floyd mayweather so i don't want to take the attention away from that fight but but how did the sparring session go because i had heard rumors that it was pretty one-sided, that Connor was, was definitely getting the better of him, and, and that's what Dana said, and, and now other people have said that, so I kind of feel justified in, in what I've heard. But as much as you can tell me, how did that sparring session go? I mean, honestly, uh, Pauly just got absolutely destroyed. And, and you know, he, he, he started saying that, oh, we leaked the pictures, but out of the decency, we, we actually weren't talking about the sparring at all, and we weren't saying much, because we thought, okay, whatever happens in sparring stays in sparring. But he was the one that came out with all the interviews. He was doing 20 interviews on his way back from uh, from sparring session. So then we just released, you know, uh, there, there was like only one or two pictures that, you know, uh, we posted. That there wasn't really actually anything coming from our side but then it just got to a point where he kept doing interviews and kept moaning and kept talking so we had to give our side of the story so we just we we, we, we said it how it happened and uh, you know that video was released obviously by dana of the sparring session and uh, there was a few pictures uh, and you can see for yourself what exactly happened there yeah were you you know you, you you know connor you know probably better than anyone in terms of not only being his friend but also being his sparring partner have you been impressed with how much you know Connor has done in terms of his boxing, whether it's been Paulie Malinaji, I know he's been sparring with Deshaun Johnson, Tiernan and Bradley, yourself. I mean, have you been impressed by by seeing Connor's transformation into a pure boxer over these last few months? <laughs> Uh, you know, th there was no surprise for me. I already knew he had those skills. I already knew he could uh, he could easily uh, uh, be one of the best. Uh, to be the best boxer, you know, uh, in, in today's world, because, you know, this is nothing new to him. Conor has started with boxing. He's boxing since he's nine years old. He's got almost 50 amateur fights, uh, boxing fights. You know, th this is nothing new to him. We inspire professional boxers all the time. So, you know, people feel that he's coming into a sport as an amateur, that, you know, someone that's never boxed before. But the truth is, uh, he's boxed, uh, boxed plenty and uh, he's very, very good at it. So, uh, you know, to me, it has come as no surprise. I already knew that he would be very dominant in the boxing world. I've been suggesting uh, that to him for a long time. Boxing is, a, is not an easy sport. It's a very difficult sport. But compared to MMA, it is a, a walk in the park. It's a lot easier on your body. So uh, for many years, you know, I was suggesting to Conor, why doesn't he take a boxing fight? It's easier on the body. It's easier prep. And, you know, it's a lot of money. So why not do it? So here we are now. Yeah, I don't you know if you remember, we had this conversation, Arden, before your last fight against Cub Swanson, so that's going back a couple of months when we talked, um, but I, I talked to you back then, and I, I told you my prediction for the fight, you told me your prediction for the fight, now here we sit, you know, literally days away from the fight, has your opinion on how this fight's going to play out, in, you know, changed at all over these last few months, seeing what Connor's done, seeing the preparation he's had, I mean, has your prediction for this fight changed at all, I believe you said within four rounds, which is what Connor said, I predicted a third round knockout, so has any of that changed since then, as you, as you sit here now, days away from the fight? Uh, no, I, I actually predicted six rounds, uh, and I think I'm going to stick to that, the reason being is obviously boxing is a... Uh, uh, the rounds only three minutes long, you know, they're not five minute rounds like an MMA and you know those extra two minutes You know, it can be a lot in, in a round, you know um, 
it's a lot easier to survive the three minutes. So I feel that that will allow uh, Mayweather, and of course his experience, you know, and uh, his uh, his defensive work will allow him to survive till till mid midway of the fight. But I don't see him getting out of the sixth round. Yeah, and you 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 feel it will be another? You know, do you feel it will be a knockout, or do you feel it'll be a TKO where he just puts him down multiple times? No, I, I feel it, it most likely will be a knockout. Connor has Connor has addressed this, and and I'm curious on your side, Artem. You know, he he says you know he will he will stay and he'll do boxing and he'll do MMA. But in your opinion, do you think Connor, if he knocks out Floyd Mayweather, do you feel like his next fight will be boxing or MMA? Do you do if you were if you were giving him advice, what would you say? Um, well, to be honest, is uh, you see one thing you have to remember about Connor. He's a very competitive guy, so he will be where the competition is right now. You know, him uh, beating Mayweather. This is something that very few people believe can happen. So that's motivation for him. This is what's motivating him to do this. You know, he's a, he's such a competitive guy. You won't find a guy as competitive as him. Like if you were to give a hundred million to all the UFC fighters right now, you, you know, very few of them would ever come back for another fight. But you know, Connor is different. You know, he is not motivated by by money you know uh you know he's got uh, different motives you know so so he will be back doing both uh, mma and boxing you know, depending where the challenge presents itself you're listening to fight society with damon martin and jeremy lober check it out oh we got us a little fight on the horizon Oh, I'm excited, Dave. There's no better walkout in sports than Connor oh, walking out to this and then bleeding into Notorious B.I.G. Oh, yeah, dude. I love it. Well, Did you see the tease for Connor's new Beats commercial? No, I haven't seen that yet. There's a, he, he released it last night. I think the commercial's coming out today. It's a little 15-second clip. It's like a singing version of Notorious B.I.G. Juicy. Oh, like no it's someone it. singing the song, like you know what I mean, like you know the chorus. Yeah, of, yeah, of, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. It's, technically, it's a it's a the chorus from Forget Me Nots, the old '70s song, but they redid it for Juicy. Everyone knows well, it's Juicy. This is of course Sinead O'Connor, and we wish her the most love and respect and speedy recovery. You know, she's going through some mental issues. I, I don't really want to get into. It. I was so sad I was kind of bummed because media. they announced uh, yesterday Demi Lovato is doing the national anthem. What are you talking about? She's a piece of ass. Well, no, I wasn't. I'm not degrading her, but I'm saying like she's You're doing not degrading her. <laughs> she's like, doing <laughs> she's doing the national anthem, but they didn't announce anyone doing the Irish national anthem. Uh, I was like, come on, like why? Where's Bono? Where's like an Irish singer? You ooh, know? that's two largely different scales there. Bono and Demi well, Lovato. But Bono is the Connor guy. He supported. Connor. No, that's why. Of course, and he's, he's a countryman. You know, so or some Irish. Singer, somebody, I and mean, there's got to be more. Damien Rice is out there, the Pogue, somebody. <laughs> what are the guys from the Dropkick Murphys up Some, to? Get yeah. somebody like out there singing the Irish National Anthem. You got Demi Lovato. I mean, uh, granted, you didn't exactly swing for the fences on that one, but you know. No, but she's doing all the guys in the locker room, so it's like convenient. <laughs> oh, she's already God. there. No, I'm That's, kidding, Demi, Demi. You Demi, know what's funny? Stop is, it. So I tweeted it yesterday that she was doing the National Anthem, and I swear to God, like it, at least ten responses on Twitter were, "Didn't she used to date Luke Rock?" No, we say she's doing the National Anthem. <laughs> well, because half the guys in the back, Demi right? Lovato. Demi Lovato is That's a pop star. Very disrespectful of me. Demi Lovato is a pop star, so typically you wouldn't think of Demi Lovato crossing over in MMA in terms of like the same segment of fans. So people in MMA that know her know her from that story. They no, know her from dating Luke totally. Rockhold. And then the other story that was kind of funny during I think it was two eleven. Was it two eleven? She was there and she they sat her next to Cowboy. Did and, they? And everybody's like, "Yo, <laughs> Cowboy's hitting it now. This is crazy." Cowboy, yeah, I, it's uh, but anyways, yeah. But that's so, not true. They just ha- they didn't no, go, they didn't no, go together. It's just no. like you know where they when we go with Matt, they sit us in a special section. Yeah, they and, it's, it's, yeah. yeah. But anyways, so before we get out of here, yes, time for fight picks. Oh, boy. Floyd Mayweather, Conor McGregor, put your money where your mouth is, Loper. Who are you picking and why? I'm picking Conor McGregor, and here's why. You I bastard, think- you're stealing my thunder. Because I'm picking <sighs> Conor McGregor too. Well, here's what I'll say. I'm going to pick Floyd Mayweather. No, <laughs> no I, I'm going to go. Uh, all right, I'll tell you this. After round six, I don't think Connor's going to have a whole lot of a chance. Round six, round seven is going to be that that gatekeeper's area where Floyd is going to be in his glory. We think. We think. I'm going to say Connor TKO round four. 
I uh, I'm I'm with you on the Connor pick, and the reason I'm saying this is because when the fight's over, I don't want everyone coming back and saying you picked Floyd, but you said Connor had a chance. But I really um, think Floyd's gonna win. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> I've done this too many times. There was, I remember it, it will haunt me forever. I remember when George St. Pierre fought Matt Sarah the first time. Yeah. And me and my old co-host Jeff Kane from MMA Weekly, we were talking about this, and we were both like talking ourselves into picking Matt Sarah. Like it was so an upset. I'm jealous when you bring him up. And uh, and we were talking about Matt Sarah, and we're like, Matt Sarah's got a chance. He's got that big right hand, blah, blah, blah. But we didn't do it. At the end of the podcast, we both picked George St. Pierre. Yeah. And then, of course, Matt Sarah upsets him, <laughs> and we're like, why didn't we pull the trigger? Well, this time I'm pulling the trigger. I legitimately think Conor McGregor has a shot in this fight. Yeah. I think his aggression, I think his punching power, I think he's going to rough Floyd up a little bit. And I honestly believe, and this is is playing a part in this. I think Floyd is underestimating Connor. I know, dude. I heard his training camp's kind of weak. I know the narrative that's been painted is Floyd's not training and all this other stuff. He's eating Burger King and no, all this. But I heard stuff, from but some other people that, yeah, I've heard from a couple sources that he wasn't exactly you know killing the gym every day. <laughs> uh, and Connor is. Connor's absolutely yeah, training. Connor's training to win this fight. He's I'd, trained to become once in a lifetime man. There's just something in the air, and and maybe it's because. And listen, I've covered. Connor Connor far more than I've ever covered Floyd. The last time I covered Floyd was in 2015 when he fought Manny Pacquiao. And oh, excuse me, I covered the Andre Berto fight too. Uh, so I'm not as I'm not as in tune with Floyd as I am with Connor. So I'm a Connor believer. I've just stopped doubting the guy. And there's just something. There's just something about this moment that just tells me that Connor's going to win. So I'm picking Connor McGregor by knockout, third round. Third round. Third round. <laughs> this is crazy, man. So when the podcast is over a week from now, and we come back and we talk about this because we're going to have Dan Hardy and Dominic Cruz on the podcast after the, the fight. No one can say that we didn't stick our necks out and say we're picking Connor. Now, if Floyd wins, then we both look like dumbasses. But <laughs> for right now, yeah, kind of. We're listen. I I agree. Floyd Mayweather. If the fight goes past round, I think if the past, fight goes past round five, it's going to be all Floyd. You know what I mean? It's going to be tough. You know, it's going to be tough for Connor at that point, but. Connor can't box him. Connor needs to fight him. Connor needs to go out there and rough him up and go after it. And he needs to counter Floyd. And if he can do all that, if he can, if he can, if he can fight his game plan and stick to it and not get intimidated by the moment, which Connor typically doesn't, I think he's got a chance to win this fight. Now, like I said, I could be completely wrong. So many people have tried to rough him up. Yeah. It's you know, it's not worked up to this point. We'll but see. 40, 40 years old. I'm still I'm sticking with Connor. Eight ounce gloves, which I really don't think makes a difference, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, that was a, more of a. T that's what I'm saying. It's like another talking point. I just feel like Malinaji, the gloves, there's certain aspects to this, obviously, that plays more into the spectacle. But So you're saying fourth round TKO? Yeah, but I got to stay true to our, to our sport and, you know, support ours like everybody else is uh, in boxing. So, uh, yeah, we'll see next week, man. Thanks so much for all the support. Good luck to Conor McGregor this weekend. Good luck to Floyd Mayweather. We'll definitely be watching. And as the world is watching, what will the decision or the results be? Can't wait for uh, next week when we get back together to talk about it, man. Damon Martin, you can check him out uh, each and every... Uh, you update that website pretty often, man. NerdcoreMovement.com. If you're into The Walking Dead, if you're into Game of Thrones, all of the great television. Season finale. Of what a weekend. Mayweather McGregor on Saturday night. Game of Thrones season finale on Sunday night. You couldn't pick a better weekend to stay indoors. That really is insane. And then we're honest. going to Boba Flex on Friday. That's another thing we're doing. So yeah, we got, we got a full Columbus. weekend. Yeah. I'm going to Lady Gaga tonight. Oh, my wife thought that was last <laughs> no, night. No, tonight. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, I'm going to Lady Gaga tonight, and then I'm going to Boba Flex. Talk about a change in, <laughs> change in genre of music. I'm going to Boba Flex Friday night, album release party, and then uh, and then Saturday, Mayweather McGregor, Sunday, Game of Thrones. I've invited so many people to my house, it's ridiculous. Coleman's coming over, right? I, I, yeah, I think Coleman's coming. Uh, Adam DeSabato will be there. Uh, yeah, we're going to have uh, gonna a party. I'm going to Skype Matt Brown in. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be awesome. Hey. Guys, check me out. Loper and Randy. Randy with an I. L-O-P-E-R-A-N-D-R-A-N-D-I dot com. We have a vlog channel on YouTube. You guys can check us out. My daily radio show. You can download the app and listen. And we will check you guys out next week, man. Later. red and black lumberjack with the hat to match. Remember rapping Duke? The hard, the hard. You never thought that hip hop would take it this far. Now I'm in the limelight because I rhyme tight. Time to get paid. Blow up like the world trade.